In a recent essay competition from the Northeastern University London, one of the essay questions was whether English literature should be replaced by global literature. I thought that this was a fascinating question, especially given the recent changes in education. So I thought that for today's video, I might offer some thoughts on it. of defining English literature has long been a topic debated by scholars. When defining English literature, do we take into account all the literature that's British or all the literature that was originally written in English? If we take into account Britain's colonial legacy, do we take into account the work produced by the colonies when they were under Britain's rule and call them English literature as well? In contrast, defining global literature has been comparatively simpler. Any literature that was written in the world in any language. The critic Damrosh in What is World Literature? 2003 argued that a work enters the subject simply by being read, by circulating into a world beyond its linguistic and cultural point of origin. This concept of circulation has been further supported by critics such as Venkat Mani in 2012, who claimed that world literature occurs through the transfer of information. It's difficult to disagree with this as the 21st century becomes increasingly more interconnected. Globalization as a term in sociology refers to the integration of political, social, cultural, and economic elements to produce a new global culture, to create a unified way of life with shared norms, ideas, values, economies. It is driven by technological development, mutual reliance, but also the distribution of media. Take into account the recent wave of K-pop and K-dramas, the Hallyu. There has been a whole exhibition devoted to it in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. How many of you are wearing jeans right now instead of traditional cultural clothes? Or how many of you ate a hamburger recently rather than traditional food? Globalization does not necessarily mean that you abandon your culture. People still wear their traditional clothes at traditional events like weddings or one year, one year anniversaries. People still eat traditional food. People still watch their own media like Bollywood, for example. Globalization just means that there is something new added into your culture, something that's integrated from others. Such is the case with world literature. The term world literature can be traced back all the way to the 19th century with Goethe's famous world literature. In fact, H.M. Posnet and other critics argued that the term can be traced even further, all the way back to the Romans. Posnet argued for literary relativity. He argued that all different regions and all different countries, or in this case, different areas within the empire, have their own share, or have their own shared culture, have their own shared forms, and so their literature should be taken from the perspective in which they were written, rather than from a Eurocentric approach or any other form of approach. But I digress. In Eckerman's conversations with Goethe, the writer professed that national literature is now a rather unmeaning term. The epoch of world literature is at hand and everyone must strive to hasten its approach. Later, Marx and Engels drew inspiration, claiming that national one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness become more and more impossible, and from the numerous national and local literatures, there arises a world literature, from the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Thus, the inevitability of world literature has long been discussed, and yet still English literature is a subject that persists to be taught in schools. For all the recent accusations of retaining colonial history, especially the stolen items from the British Museum, and and all the discussions of literary legacy from Derek Walcott's post-colonial movement to Rebecca Kwong's recent hit Yellow Face. So many accusations, debates, discussions have been taking place, but the curriculum still remains largely unreformed. Perhaps this lack of change is due to the persisting importance of nationalism within one country. Nationalism, the identification with one's own nation, support of its interests, is built through a shared culture with similar values and similar language. Nationalism impacts foreign policy, influences the economy, sways political elections. The world today doesn't have many positive connotations, especially given our uneasy history. In 2019, the German president called it an ideological poison. Yet many politicians still continue to use it as a powerful tool of control. Promoting nationalism means people still have more allegiance to their own country. They feel a sort of care, a sort of belonging to the, to the citizens of their own country. They're less likely to vote away, more likely to be involved in the country's politics, and hence, well, more likely to support certain decisions over others. The us versus them mentality prioritizes the nation over, for example, foreign influences. The populist promises of nationalism, of 
making a country great again or uniting it through shared values that the liberals have been taken away appeals to certain groups, for example, the working class, because they might feel more protected under such an ideology. This is the entire reason that politicians adopt that ideology. Not necessarily because they genuinely believe that a country should be, well, pure, as history has shown some people did. Because they are trying to appeal to the nation, they're trying to take the populist approach, and they're trying to sway away, win elections and sway results. So how does it happen that for example, these working class groups are more likely to support them. Well, they feel worried about the globalizing nature of the world. They feel worried that an immigrant is going to come and take away their job and do the work for cheaper than they do. So of course they go to support these ideas. An example of this is Brexit, with the UK believing that they can make it alone without EU support, that they can be independent without relying too much on foreign influence and feeling too controlled by EU rules and regulations. Actually, polls showed that most people had no idea what Brexit really was. In the end, the decision ended up passing by a very narrow margin, and in recent years, polls have shown that although that margin is still narrow, people now believe that Brexit was a bad decision, so politicians at the time played on emotion. And appealing to the national sense of unity and pride to say, we can make it without the EU, we can make it without foreign influences. Politicians have long utilized traditional values for their agenda, and to bring this back to literature, we have the recent cases of book banning. In 2021, according to the American Library Association report, there were 330 book challenges in autumn, a considerable rise compared to previous years. There were 729 attempts to censor library resources, and in the first eight months of 2022, there were 681 attempts targeting 1,651 different books. One of the earliest examples of book banning in history was the Catholic Church, who didn't want people to have their own copy of the Bible, and they only approved one translation, a translation that was in Latin. At the time, not many people knew Latin, first of all, and books were highly expensive, so not everyone could afford it, which means that the only people who had access to these books would be, well, the well-educated and the wealthy. Why? Well, because people are easier to control when they can only rely on your viewpoint. If the people's only connection with God is the church rather than the Bible, which they can read themselves, they view the church as the legitimate authority. If we look at a more modern example, with the development of printing presses, censorship became harder, and during the Cold War, both America and Russia pretty much restricted books that portrayed the enemy in any form of good light. Even great classics like Ulysses were targeted because of their sexual content in Britain. Look at the recent case with Salman Rushdie, the attempted assassination. I mean, people hated the book so much that they were willing to issue a reward for the author's head. In America today, the drive to ban books comes from traditionally red states. It's an effort to drive people towards a more conservative ideology as people become increasingly more concerned with the influence of the liberals. You can look at the statistics to see exactly what books are being challenged and where, and I have also linked my Instagram post on the topic before so you can see the full list, but really, if you look at the content, the majority of books that are being challenged are not, let's say, white books or American books that show classic American culture. They're books from people of color or books from LGBTQ communities because these are views that are, well, the minority views. And so what conservative states are trying to do is to push them out of the spotlight, to promote a traditional viewpoint, to promote a more conservative viewpoint as it is in their interest to retain the support of the citizens. Primary socialization is a key stage in our life, so curtailing the books that children are allowed to read limits expression and the viewpoints that they're allowed to perceive. It's about not discussing the ideas to keep with an ideological view of how children see American society, said Jeffrey Sachs, Acadia University, in an interview with Vox. Traditional views are at odds with the globalization of society. It goes against the traditional belief of straying not too far from home and having children and settling down and being the breadwinner for men and the homemaker for the woman. It goes against identifying with one place, one culture, 
a form of nationalism. The sociologist Anthony D. Smith defined nationalism as entailing a focus on national autonomy, unity, and identity. And since books have proven to change the ways in which we think, influencing opinions and reading the books that demonstrate this autonomy, this unity of a nation, can be crucial in creating a person with a strong national identity. Someone who's more willing to vote for certain political agendas, someone who's less willing to be critical of the wrongdoings of the government, especially if they have been taught from an early age in the books that they read, that the opinion that the politicians are pushing is the only correct opinion. I will link the studies I read in the description box so you can see just how influential a simple picture book can be and the connection between willingness to vote in political, in political elections and a strong sense of national identity. I mean, it makes sense if you think about it. If you care about your country, you care about shaping it. And you do what you think is right and you vote for the politicians that you think will do it right. <laughs> Of course, governments want someone less critical of their positions. Politics center on popularity, perceptions, tactics. Look at the recent case with the Prime Minister Jane in Britain, Liz Trust, who lasted less than a cabbage. I mean, look at the disturbances in France, or look at the long-term presidential elections of Eastern European countries, certain Eastern European countries. For all these parties, support is crucial, and for that reason, governments are rarely eager to remove a subject that promotes their country's history or values. And for that reason, English literature still persists in Britain, because it instills English values, it instills English culture, just like it would in any other country. These values are there to instill benefit for the nation because it's in the interest of governments to keep its citizens there because what use is a citizen if they decide that they don't like it in their country and they flee to a more democratic country or they go somewhere because they've read about the culture and they're fascinated by it so they go to boost another country's economy, a competing nation's economy. What use are citizens who have read widely for politicians who want to keep a certain agenda? If you're pushing for well, only whiteness in a country. You don't want citizens who have read diverse books, who have read about slavery, who have read about the wrongdoings of Britain's past or any other country's past for that matter because no country is purely clean, no country's slate is perfect. The benefit for governments is one of the biggest reasons why English literature still exists today why Russia has Russian literature, why China has Chinese literature, why every country has its own form of literature. Every country values its history and every country wants to retain the purity of its history and of its culture. And for that reason, they're not quick to introduce, well, foreign influences. Moreover, there remain educational issues in carrying out such transitions. It would not be easy to replace English literature with global literature as a wealth of considerations is to be taken into account. There are 195 countries in the world today, so will the subject of global literature be covering all 195 of them in a single year? How would students be expected to cover every work equally, to cover every work in relevant detail, and how would teachers be expected to teach this? If we were instead to limit the scope and say, okay, 195 countries is way too much for a single academic year, then what countries would we pick? Would we order them from most significant to least significant? How would we decide who's most significant? Is it the country that aligns with our Eurocentric values if we're in Europe and our Eastern values if we're in Asia? If we were to decide on these questions, how would we choose which work to teach? How would we, as an outsider with no understanding of the language and merely a translation, be expected to know which work has had the most cultural significance? which work is worth studying, which work has the beauty of language that we want to demonstrate to our children. If we choose to do only novels, which in Asia are a minor genre, how would we choose a work that represents the country's rich cultural variety? If we were to choose novels in a country famous for, for example, po poetry. And what do we do if the chosen work does not have a translation? Do we translate it? 
or do we utilize a poor translation which in many cases may be worse than not reading the book at all? If the curriculum would cover works by continent, the decision within a single continent would not in fact be easier. How would we justify choosing Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's work over, for example, Ghanaian author Yaji Asi's Homegoing? Of course, if we were to make such a decision, it would not only impact the education of our children, it would impact the future foreign policies of our nation. How would you, how would you explain to a diplomatic team that, oh, sorry, we have good relationships, but your work didn't make it onto our curriculum. Stanford scholar Franco Moretti, in his work Conjectures on World Literature, argued that the scale of world literature would demand distant reading. And rather than a focus on linguistics or the progression of a nation's literary movement, as time allows when focusing on one country's literature, looking at large scales would allow for a more comprehensive understanding of the work. Would the difficulties in establishing the global literature curriculum even merit the replacement? Furthermore, education goes beyond simply the curriculum. Teachers are like doctors too. They treat our health, our mental health rather than our physical health. But teachers are people and teachers are flawed. They have their own prejudices, they have their own perceptions, they have their own understandings of different cultures. How would we expect one teacher to teach a work in the same way that we would expect another. The curriculum's aim is to be standardized across the nation, to provide children with options, but to provide them with equality to make sure that the outcome of our standardized exams are equal. Every country has its mediocre teachers, and if they're mediocre at teaching works that they have known from their own culture, then how would we expect them to do well at teaching a work from a culture that they have never known? It has to be said that with the prominence of the modern day cancel culture and how quickly people, people rush to bash someone for getting it wrong or for saying the wrong thing and for not keeping up with the recent trends on political correctness, how would we ensure that teachers are not scared to, well, teach, especially given that they don't understand enough about the subject? And if we were to, well, teach them, to teach them to understand these new ideas, how would we reform this curriculum quickly enough to keep in line with the changes that we propose? I mean, of course, the obvious solution that an idealist might offer would be to just, oh, well, just hire more diverse teachers. But if we look at statistics in Britain and in many other countries, I mean, the majority of positions are held by citizens from that country. So in Russia, you're not going to have a Ghanaian teacher in the list of top 100 teachers because they're in the minority. And even if they are citizens of Russia, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that they would choose a teaching profession. When you consider this on a practical level, I think the practicalities show that it's just far from easy to replace the subject. Would it be worth it though to undergo all this? Well, to answer this question, I think we should first examine and go back to the very question that haunts us be beneath all this. Why do students study literature in the first place? The point of a subject as a humanities discipline is to develop the student's critical analysis, to instruct them the on the importance of language, to show the value of examining different sides of the story, and to develop empathy, to develop cultural knowledge. These are all invaluable skills that can be developed with the introduction of global literature. It would create a new form of cultural code. And although a part of me is just raring to go into another rabbit hole of thinking what that would do into the intergenerational connectedness if the older generations had one cultural code they grew up on and the younger generations had another one, let's stick to the topic. And that is that literature is well, connected. You can't read literature without reading other literature. A single book does not exist on its own. Studying global literature would help students understand this inextricability. They would help understand this interconnectedness because Ulysses would not be Ulysses without the Odyssey. And Pale Fire would not be Pale Fire without the Brothers Karamazov. Or Eugene Onegin or Robert Frost poetry. The author has read these works and has been influenced them and has put those influences into writing. We have all grown up on certain novels that influence the way we think, which is why it's so important not to curb the access to the literature that we give our children, even if it is ideologically sound or isn't ideologically sound in our opinion. To read one book is now to read many more. 
Because to quote Nabokov, a good reader, a major reader, an active and creative reader is a re-reader. Consciously or subconsciously, other books have influenced both the author and the reader and well, everything in the book. Just like Nabokov argued that we cannot understand the, complex the complexity of reading from just one read, we cannot understand the complexity of literature from having just one perspective. For example, with global literature, we could see not only the English perspective on colonialism, but the post-colonial perspective too. To counter the messages of Robinson Crusoe and Dracula and Jane Eyre, we would have White Sargasso Sea and the Satanic Verses and Midnight's Children. Children and adults both would be better equipped to deal with a diverse range of opinions because the aim in theory, and we'll come back to this, should be to develop critical thinking in children. Because if we think about it, liberal ideology, even if it is better in terms of empathy than, for example, ideology on the far right, is still a form of ideology that we impose on children rather than raising them to be centrist and form their own opinions, I suppose. Having literature in a curriculum is there to form those valuable skills I mentioned in the beginning. Because cancelling people is a form of censorship, but so is banning books. The curriculum forms all these skills, for sure, which is why it's important to discuss what books we're putting on it and why. but. Those skills are really developed with practice and with reading more. To read everything, you first need to read one thing. To understand postmodernism, you need to understand modernism. And to understand modernism, you need to understand the preceding movement. And to understand the preceding movement, you need to understand what literary movements are as a whole and what makes the movements. And to understand that, you need to read more literature. And to read more literature, you need to read a single book. And to read a single book, you need to know how to read. And thus, if it all boils down to being able to read and to be able to read critically, should we not be more concerned with the levels of literacy? There has been a recent trend on social media where people have been reading the covers of news headlines and then summarizing the news articles. And what does it say about our collective level of literacy if we need somebody else to understand the news? There is no doubt that studying global literature would help us understand other countries' cultural codes better and perhaps raise us to be more empathetic global citizens. It would develop our skills as a reader, as a writer, as a person, because to truly engage with another country's culture is to travel without moving, to broaden our horizons, introduce us to a style different from our own, and witness firsthand just how important language is. Global literature would also be beneficial to teaching literature as a whole in developing different skills. For example, Chinese literature is far more rich with med like metaphors and idioms than English literature. And even if the linguistic richness, as Gayatri Spivak has said, has been lost in translation, Teaching your children to unpack these metaphors, teaching them to look, be to look below the surface, to infer from the lines, is a necessary skill that can be applied to English literature too. Literature connects us, it acts as a bridge, as a gateway into people's minds. And to have that bridge be expanded on by integrating different literature, by exposing children from an early age to different cultures, would just ensure that that bridge's foundation is far stronger for for the benefit of the future of humanity. But before we do all this, bearing in mind all these fantastic benefits and acknowledging the current problems of nationalism and the political wars of the left and right in an increasingly polit polarized political state, I think that we should be wary of quickly reforming the curriculum without considering the practicalities. We cannot rush into something head first when we have long-standing issues to deal with. We cannot complain about the quality of teaching and say that this quality would necessarily be superior if we have not retrained the current teachers that we have. I do not mean that we should not try to replace the subject. By all means, it would be beneficial to integrate one into another, perhaps. Although it could thus be argued that replacing English literature with global literature would be an unfairly difficult transition to carry out given the state right now, we must remember that the question is not how this transition can be carried out. A reformation of the curriculum that allows for students to gain a deeper understanding of different countries' work without sacrificing breadth or depth is a necessity. Creating a system that focuses on interdisciplinary collections like foreign relations or history would further enhance our knowledge of literature and make it easier for both adults and children to understand. 
In the future, the subject should be replaced only if it doesn't sacrifice the unique depth that is currently being offered at English literature as a subject. Perhaps if one was an element of another, or the other was an element of the, of the, fur, of the former, then it would be a worthwhile transition. Because it would provide a deeper comprehension of literature as a whole, and after all, that is the goal. It should not come at the cost of teaching literature and teaching children to love literature. Because the aim is not for countries to compete and say my culture is better than your culture. The aim is to promote a love for reading. Literature can be a transformative experience, and to experience that transformation, we should reach out to books beyond those familiar with us. So, what do you think? Let me know in the comments and thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you soon!